Good afternoon, St. Louis. Good evening, Europe. Welcome and welcome back for this third and last event of the second season of the International Writers Series, a new collaboration between the International Writers Track of the Program in Comparative Literature and the University Libraries to celebrate new publications of creative works by writers and translators in our community at Washington University in St. Louis. Our two guests are simply amazing. As amazing and as unique as the book we are going to talk about this afternoon, Esther Dischereit will present her first volume of poems in English, translations, sometimes a single leaf translated by Ian Galbraith, which appeared in, two, uh, in 2020 with ARC Publications. The book includes selections from three of her German books of poems, as well as samples of more recent uncollected poems. Sometimes a single leaf takes its title from a relatively short poem in the collection, which I would like to read aloud for you. Sometimes a single leaf sails to the ground, caught by an air plume and released. I dance after the, re the leaf and cannot remember the steps. I falter, arms flailing. The leaf will not fly again as it did this once. No leaf will fly like this one, as I recently told you. The poem, compellingly rendered by Ian Galbraith with the sparse lines and subtle rhythms of Dischereit's German refers, pays tribute to the fleeting world, the irreproducible flight of a leaf buffeted by the wind, which the human voice can only try and fail to trail in a kind of dance. The poem lays bare the fragility, ephemerality and irreplaceability of singular existence and of language. But if reanimation and even fictional reenactment is impossible, the final line, as I recently told you, allows at least for repetition and memory. That seems to be the task which Dischereit sets for herself as a poet, the telling and maybe understanding of existence through repeated retelling, where time and history fail to make sense. Time has no meaning it has material, Dischereit writes. Indeed, her poems lend a striking quality to the collisions of past and present, one often figured in vestige and residues, where the splinters, a term Galbraith discusses in his preface, shards, streaks or dust. Born in Germany in 1952 to a Jewish mother who had survived the Holocaust in hiding, Esther Dischereit grew up in a haunted society where the crimes of the recent past were effectively suppressed despite their omnipresent traces. These poems in English translation, drawn from previously published collections spanning the years 1969 to 2007, as well as from more recent work, give voice to the disorientation and the pain, as well as to endurings and resolve in the unwelcome work of calling history to account, of bearing witness to the ghostly one's words invisible to her contemporaries. Esther Dischereit is not only a poet, but also a novelist, essayist, and stage and radio dramatist. Dischereit's work is named as, quote, perhaps the most important German Jewish voice of the second generation after the Shoah. She founded the Avant-Garde project, where music and worked as a curator for contemporary art and new media at the DGB, the German Trade Union Confederation in Berlin-Brandenburg, she has also taught literature and creative writing in a number of venues. We have the distinct pleasure of hosting her here in St. Louis, at least in the virtual realm, as our Max Kade visiting writer, thanks to Professor Mike Lützeler, who, under the auspices of the Max Kade Centers for Contemporary German Literature, houses in the German depart housed in the German department of Washington University, invites prominent German writers and critics each year to teach a graduate seminar on contemporary German literature. Thanks to Mike's tireless commitment, this unique program is now in its 36th year. The preface of Sometimes a Single Leaf by translator Ian Galbraith provides biographical context and introduces rich avenues of interpretation to aid readers in understanding Esther Dischereit's many frames of reference. One can indeed read some of Esther's poems as distillations of German romanticism into a single world or image, like the moon, flowers, a lone tree, Beethoven, Snow White, or even a beer. 
and one will be horrified to see these placed in effaced landscapes of horror such as Dachau or Plötzensee. History is no poem, but every poem has history. But before we take a closer look at the poems, let me briefly introduce our second guest. Esther will be joined in conversation by Aaron McLaughlin, Professor of German Jewish Studies. Aaron McLaughlin is the author of Second Generation Holocaust Literature, Legacies of Survival and Perpetration, 2006, and has co-edited two volumes, After the Digital Divide, German Aesthetic Theory in the Age of New Digital Media, 2009, and Persistent Le Legacy, The Holocaust and German Studies, 2016. A third co-edited volume, The Construction of Testimony, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah and its Outtakes, appeared in 2020. Additionally, she has published articles in major journal and edited volumes on Art Spiegelman's Mouse, Ruth Klüger's Weiterleben, Edgar Hilsenrath's Der Nazi und der Friseur, Bernhard Schlink's Der Vorleser and other fiction and non-fiction work of, of Holocaust literature and film in German-Jewish literature. Her most recent book, The Mind of the Holocaust Perpetrator in Fiction and Non-Fiction, has just come out this spring with Wayne State University Press. In addition to, to a comparative fo focus on the literature of the Holocaust, McLaughlin research and teaching interests include post-war and contemporary German literature, Jewish studies, narrative theory, autobiography, and the graphic novel. We will also be joined by poet and translator Anka Roncha, who grew up in Romanian, speaks modern Greek and French, and writes and publishes in English. She's a current PhD student in the International Writers' Track and Comparative Literature at Washington University in St. Louis, but joins us today from Romania. Her work can be found in the Berkeley Poetry Review, Beaches Magazine, Omniverse and Asymptote, in the Bear Life Review and Lana Turner. Anka will read Esther's poems in English. I would like to thank Washington University's library for making these events possible as well as a committee on competitive literature and simply all other departments of arts and sciences and numerous individuals who are involved. I want furthermore to take a moment to express my special thanks and deepest gratitude to our incomparable subject librarian Walter Slecht, who is my partner in crime in setting up the International Writer Series. He's currently, as you know, overseeing all the technical stuff of our webinar. Let us now delve deep, delve deep into history and poetry. Please join me in welcoming Esther Dischereit and Aaron McLaughlin with a big round of virtual applause. Enjoy the conversation and the readings from sometimes a single leaf during the next 60 minutes. The floor is yours, Esther. Yeah. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you all for having me, for having invited me to this uh, university. I'm, I'm not here for the first one, we just talked about that, but it's uh, the first uh, opportunity for me to get to know the students more close because I teach. Yeah, and uh, what's to say? Yeah, really thank you for, for Anka. You will join me and uh, yeah I will start right away and I think it's maybe it's even the very very first reading out of this book now because of the uh, pandemic it wasn't possible to do it somewhere else so this is a real I would say uh, premiere so um, I also would like especially to say hello to my students. <laughs> I'll start with Ich koch unter Berlin. Sometimes a single leaf. Yeah. Ich koch unter Berlin und lebte wie eine Ratte vom Ausguss der Menschen, die um den Tisch herum saßen. Beim Läuten der Glocken zuckten wir zusammen und hielten uns die jüdischen Ohren. Nach dem Verklingen der Kollekte schwappten Milch und Brot von der Stiege, die eines Tages unter uns knarrte. Mein Gesicht hungerte vor Sonne. Der Luftzug zwischen den Dielen verriet mir den heißen August. 
So schien es mir nach dreimal Juni im März. Lagen zerknittert auf unseren Betten in Anzug und Kleid und gelb gestrickter Weste und waren den Büchern bereit für Gespräche, den Büchern. Ein Stampfen harter Schritte lief uns über die Köpfe und Hand, versteckten wir uns hinter dem Lied seiner Augen. Eines Tages krochen wir die Stiege herauf in mein rasendes Herz auf die letzten Jahre und schlug es immer mehr laut, raste mir nach in die anderen Länder, bis ich heimkehrte in meinen Keller und mich entschloss. Und mich entschloss. I crept beneath Berlin and lived like a rat from the drains of the people who sat around the table. When the bells tolled, we cowered and winced and held our Jewish ears. When offertory noises faded, milk and bread sloshed from the staircase, which one day would creak under us. My face was starved for lack of sun. The draught through the floorboards told me August was hot and here, so it seemed after three times June in March. Lying crumpled on our beds in suits, dresses, and a yellow knit waistcoat, we were ready to converse with the books. A pounding of hard steps passed over our heads and hands, we hid behind the lid of his eye. One day we crept up the staircase into my frenzied heart for these last years and how much harder it beat carrying after me to other countries until I came home to my cellar and was resolved. The next one is called Fähre nach Wannsee, dann weiter. Licht über dem Wasserspiegel mit der Fahrkarte für die S-Bahn. Die Leute packen Feuerwerkskörper ins Boot und ein paar ihre Brote. Die Passagiere fahren bis zur Hüfte, versunken im See. Nur die Arme bleiben über Wasser. Wer draußen sitzt, kann eine rauchen. Käsekuchen auf Schweizer Art, sagte der Mann und goss die türkischen Gläser auf. Früher war er bei Osram. Seine Familien saßen auch im Café und schauten zu, wenn ein Fremder eine Bockwurst bestellte. Manchmal stand einer auf und half, eine Tasse Kaffee zu machen. Salsa kam aus der Steckdose. Weihnachtskugeln neben dem Kühlschrank, aufgeschichtet wie riesige Rumtrüffel, die Sekt- und Biergläser, trugen Geweihe. Toilette für Nichtkunden, 50 Cent. Ich zweifle, ob ich den Ort wiederfinde. Vielleicht ist er das nächste Mal nicht mehr da. Ferry to Vance, then on. Light across the surface of the water with the S-Bahn ticket. People are stowing fireworks in the boat and some their sandwiches. The passengers traveling up to their hips in the lake. Only their arms still above water. If you sit outside, you can have a smoke. Cheesecake Swiss style, said the men and filled our Turkish glasses. He used to be at Osram. His families were sitting in the cafe too and watched when some strangers wanted a bokwurst. Now and then one of them got up to help with the coffees. There was piped salsa, Christmas bubbles next to the fridge, stacked like giant rum truffles, the champagne and beer classes had antlers. Restroom for non-clients, 50 cents. I doubt I'll find this place again. Perhaps next time it won't be here. Plötzensee Strand. Plötzensee Strand kostet am Abend 5,50 Euro für die Familie, sonst sieben. Also springen sie gegenüber von der steinernen Wand. Da kostet es nichts. Paar Wege weiter wurden sie hingerichtet, die vom 20. Juli und andere. Gepflegt ist es hier, Tretboote und Ruderboote im Sonntagsverleih. Sie wurden in Unterwäsche gehängt und dabei gefilmt. Am Bistrotisch sitzen zwei Frauen und trinken ein Hefeweizen. 
Eine spricht von der pommerschen Großmutter und wie sie immer noch voller Misstrauen steckt, verstört ist vor allem, was fremd ist. Das Bier ist kühl und gut gezapft. Kleine Wellen schlagen unter dem Balkon auf, wo die Frauen reden. Montag früh ist es hier menschenleer und die Woche lang bleibt es so. Da bleiben nur die Hingerichteten bis zum Wochenende, wenn die Kühlboxen gebracht werden, die Sonnenschirme und Strandkörbe. Strandkörbe gleich hinter Wedding Drive. Gleich hinter Wedding Drive. Und Großmarkt Westhafen. Wedding? Natürlich Wedding. Wedding heißt doch Hochzeit, oder nicht? Plotzensee Beach costs five euros fifty in the evening for the whole family, otherwise seven. So they jump in off the stone wall opposite where it costs nothing. Few roads further down is where they got executed. The 20 July people and others. It's neat and tidy here. Paddle boats and rowing boats for hire on Sundays. They hang them in their underwear, film the whole thing, sitting at the bistro table, two women drinking wheat beer, one talking about her grandmother from Pomerania, of how she is still deeply suspicious, distraught, more like especially anything foreign. The beer is cool and well drawn, tiny weave slap on the shore, wave slap on the shore under the terrace where the women are talking. It's completely deserted here on the Monday mornings, and so it stays all week. The executed left to themselves till the weekend when the coolers come out the beach umbrellas and beach chairs. Beach chairs just after wedding drive and West Hafen Market. Wedding, oh yes, wedding, of course. Wedding does mean wedding, no? Thank you very much. Yeah, so, um... There's so much to say about the, these poems that you chose, and I noticed that they were chosen from uh, from two different uh, volumes uh, that of German poetry, two different original um, volumes of poetry. You have four uh, separate uh, volumes that are uh, translated here, but what uh, what strikes me is the um, the relationship between the, these poems. They seem to speak to each other or sort of revolve around um, some similar aspects, especially the last two, um, of course. And for me, the 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 center of Berlin. I mean, Berlin is the center of this uh, this kind of poetic um, musing. Um, and really this, it's about the, the, all three of the poems really revolve around the spatial coordinates of historical violence. The, the ways in which Berlin, it's almost, you know, you can map out a sort of a, 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 an entire um, grid of historical violence, especially from the Nazi period. And the way I see it is that the, the lyrical eye is really moving um, in, within and through these spaces of historical violence and these spaces that are kind of carved out by historical violence. Um, and, and with the lyrical eye is sort of the spectral traces. There's always a residue of this violence. There's no way, I mean, in the um, manifest scene, there's nothing to be seen of the violence. It's not there anymore. It's, you've got a beach with families um, you know, uh, sunbathing on the beach, but for the lyrical eye, this this kind of um, you know it, the air is charged um, with the violence. Uh, my favorite poem of, of the three is the the first poem um, that you read, Esther. Um, ich koch unter Berlin. Um, I crept beneath Berlin, um, and as I understand it, it's really about the experience, the his historical experience of Jews who. Um, were in hiding in Berlin, what so-called U-boats, U-boat. The, the idea was that they had to um, you know, go under the surface and go into hiding. Some people went under, uh, into hiding in plain uh, sight. In this poem, um, th it's the 
actually going underground, under, under the building, um, into the cellar. Uh, and what I really love about this poem is the ways in which it moves from the beginning of, it's a really an abject experience. I crept beneath Berlin and lived like a rat. The rat being, of course, the anti-Semitic projection of, uh, of Nazi ideology from the drains of the people, really sort of living from the, in, and really this idea of Ausguss, dimension, the, the kind of the, the, the residue of, of people, the, the, their own, you know, even bodily fluids. I mean, that's a really abject image, but the movement of the poem is a really a, a sense of reclaiming that space of the underground as something um, positive or at least I, identity building. Um, and I really love that, especially um, uh, the, 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 the oppositions between inside and outside uh, in the poem uh, and also uh, uh, above and below um, and reclaiming the idea of below is something that is, is, can be uh, a somewhat positive presence. Uh, and when I let, read the last two stanzas, I, I, uh, in, in German and in English, I thought of the word, um, I mean, First of all, this is a place, the cellar is a place of hiding, but also I thought of the word Geborgenheit, this, um, which I don't feel like has a good um, translation in English, you know, it's, it's translated as security, but it's really about this sense of feeling safe in, um, in a space. Uh, and, and that the end of it, this idea of, um, First of all, um, we hid behind the lid of his eye. It's almost a blanket, uh, sort of a, a spiritual blanket um, that the hiding people cover themselves with as a, as a form of safety or security. Um, and then of course, this leaving the cellar in the last stanza, one day we crept up the staircase into my frenzied heart and then the return, um, uh, and how much harder it be careering after me to other countries until I came home to my cellar and was resolved. It's a reclaim, it's a complete redefinition and reclaiming of that underground space that I think is, is such an interesting way to re, reconsider that history of, of abject, you know, uh, hiding and having to go underground and and in fact not only being um, the, the idea of, of being a rat projected onto people, but then forcing people to live as rats do. I think that's a, it's a really beautiful reclaiming of that. I don't know, Matthias, if you want anything about this poem or, or any of the others, or Esther, if you want to respond. Mm -hmm. Matthias, would you? Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe Esther, maybe you can kind of uh, respond if we want to engage with this, uh, with this poem. Um, mm -hmm. So what what was this process like as as an earlier poem in your career? Um, was that an important one to kind of like uh, um, create in the in the universe of the poem an identity which which uh, which which is indeed connected to so many horrors, so many traumas, so many spaces which are not comfortable to kind of like go back into that. How was that like for you to write this poem? Um, I think it's the only poem I ever wrote uh, which focuses so concrete on places, spaces, people. I suppose, I'm not sure anymore, I suppose I wrote it after 1990 something because um, after the wall came down in Berlin, um, I had access to the files of my um, family members. And by accident, I found the files uh, of my grandparents. I, I wasn't in the archive because of that. I had another reason to go there. And it was a time in between. So really 90, 90 91, it was not really clear am I allowed to have this access or not? Or does the librarian feel he could give it to me? Uh, in the end, he gave it to me and he found out uh, because I wanted to have that, 
uh, my grandparents were listed in this book, How Murdered Jews of Berlin. And uh, I told him it's not true. They, 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 they were alive, I know it. They immigrated to the United States after 45, after uh, um, surviving in hiding. So you, you could delete them from this list. And he was saying, oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this nearly never happens, yeah. Um, and I think um, surely after this uh, event, I um, remember the family narration mm -hmm. about their being bought underground wherever we, I never knew exactly what, where, because um, my mother died uh, when I was 14. So I was too young to ask all these questions. Uh, could you please? And so, so and, and, and I actually, I didn't dare to do that anyway. So um, I, I put together all splinters I had found around them. And uh, it's in a way it's dedicated to them. It's dedicated also to the priest uh, who, who made this hiding uh, possible. Also, it was not the only stop at their uh, way underground, but it was the uh, one. And uh, we didn't find the place yet uh, where it really actually was. But I suppose it's um, around Prenzlauer Berg somewhere. Um, and yeah, and I've uh, researching this just nowadays, I found um, someone telling me, yeah, this person was really famous for that, but there was no list about the people who he uh, managed to, to hide uh, deep, deep in this church in, in cellars. And uh, the story was that the other person who was working with him, we, we say in German, Küster, he did the same, but they didn't tell each other. They didn't tell each other that they did this because they were yeah, afraid uh, one would be catched and uh, would, would talk. So none of them had a list who were the people they, they had uh, saved. But yeah, so, and, and also these, I'm very much interested in, in things. Yeah, you see there, there were, um, there is a, a jacket. Yeah, you, have, you put on a jacket. And if you, if you lie on a bed, completely dressed, yeah, what does it mean? It means you are uh, on your way. Um, if you hear something, you are sure you have to go. You are freezing, yeah. Or what I also found in the files from let's say 43 and up in Germany, because I was searching in the files the police stations kept, you see lots and lots and lots of suicides by Jewish people. And there were uh, reports, uh, people were found completely dressed in, in the bed. Yeah, the, the married couple, yeah. And, and I think all of these informations from other people, from our grandparents that were all coming together in this uh, poem. And, and nowadays I found uh, a, a report written by um, the first husband my mother was married to. He was also Jewish and also survived in hiding. And uh, all the people, they, they did um, reports to the Entschädigungsamt as a, um, institution for restitution. Uh, they had to do this. They had to say, where have I been and who was the writer. And what I really saw, he wrote it concretely down uh, that he was fearing the rats because it was the circumstances were so, so uh, uh, weird and so awful. So this is, it's not, it's a mixture of trauma and um, and reality and it's even more real as I intended it to be and at the end what Erin mentioned um, 
I think it's something about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So a lot of people, also not a lot. If people made it, they made it. Yeah, but they had something to carry with them then for their whole life. And like Primo Levi or Paul Celan, later committed suicide. So the, the, the trauma of the persecution came back, yeah, even though they made it outside, yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, and there was a lot, a lot of hunger in these lines where I'm uh, focusing on the sun, yeah. Yeah, they, they, there was no possibility to walk freely outside and see the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In a way, it's, I think it's a very conventional uh, poem. Yeah. While you were talking, you were mentioning uh, that uh, the, the world, which really seems to be the center of uh, your poetics, a uh, splitter, splinter. You know mm -hmm. that you kind of like try to collect splinters, and splinter is a splitter is a um, it's not only a fragment; it's also sharp. It also hurts. It also kind of like yeah. penetrates your skin, and this is exactly what this poem also does, and what a lot of poems are doing. The other two poems are more prone to everyday Berlin life that could happen any times in the twentieth century mm -hmm. to a certain part, but this is they are really pointing towards places of horror. With Plötzensee, with Wannsee, with the Wannsee conference, and uh, there's there's a lot of history here. And uh, but you're describing a surface which kind of like seems to be oblivious of this history. Is this uh, kind of like the experience you you had as a as a teenager growing up to getting to know more and more of, of the story of your parents? Oh, it's. It's hard to answer this because, in a way, um, his, his daughter in such a family, you know, even if it's not spoken, yeah, there, there is the silence does speak too. Um, so for me, the result was I was never interested in, in completing stories, mm -hmm. yeah, or or deleting fractures and put it in a hole or something, make it good. Like if you are in a museum and you see the Notre Tete and you have uh, really archeological uh, pieces, but the other pieces you, you can see are contemporary and are added. I didn't want to add, I just didn't want to add. It just, uh, it's, it's like an exhibition, yeah. I. I, I collect it and I show it to you. And it could, it could be that you understand, could be I understand, maybe not. But uh, basically it's about uh, wondering, yeah, okay. uh, what do I see if I see? Yeah, can I really be sure this is not a normal jacket, although it's just a jacket, so. Yeah, I feel in the uh, uh, fairy to Vanze, um, it ends with, I doubt I'll find this place again, perhaps next time it won't be here. And so this idea of the ephemeral um, quality of sort of that, that again, the, you know, the electrified air of knowing um, and realizing what happened in a particular space, but being pretty much the, own, own, the lyrical eye is the only person who senses this electricity. Everyone else is, you know, bathing in the beach or sitting in the cafe. Uh, and, and that idea that, you know, it, it, it really requires a kind of a, a sense, the, the poet's sense to pick up um, what's happening in these spaces. I mean, in this poem, um, um, maybe the key word is connected to glasses. Mm. This is the only sign, yeah, Turkish gläser. Mm -hmm. And Osram, this is a um, factory mm -hmm. which used to um, have work for thousands of so-called Gastarbeiter. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and, yeah, I, I, um, 
I point out when the people were thrown out and after the wall came down, lots of people uh, became workless, unemployed, more than 30,000 industrial working places were deleted. So they had to do something like little businesses and this and there and then. And um, were maybe thrown into an outer world, which is already defined by history, they might not have access to even. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but it comes, you have at the same time, you have the joy of this fairy thing. I mean, it's fine to have this this ferry and to um, use it like like a, a streetcar, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's this movement, you know, in through the space. It's sort of, uh, you know, Fähre nach Wannsee, dann weiter and on. It's it's just, a, it's a it, again, it's sort of a moment in time. And then it, yeah, people move and, and, and they go to cafes and, um, all of these, you know, all of this is is happening. It's life happening around this at this particular um, moment that's kind of frozen. Yeah, and there there is this migration, this um, constantly moving. And on the other hand, there is this not moving Wannsee, which refers to uh, also not only the lake, but also the conference Wannsee, which uh, was the, the, the place where the so-called Endlösung, uh, the, the Jewish Christian was um, decided. Yeah, this is all all in the near and all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Before we move on to the second set of poems and then uh, delve deeper into some of your themes, I want to ask you a question about how to work with your translator. In Plötzensee Beach, uh, you of course, you have to talk with him, or maybe he's super well versed, and probably he is, uh, because he did a lot of great work um, in in German history. Uh, but here is something interesting: you you end the poem with actually kind of like a wonderful light joke on wedding, uh, yeah. as as like the neighborhood in Berlin, which yeah. is absolutely untranslatable in a sense. And uh, and Ian decided to really stick with the wedding, wedding, wedding. Uh, wedding does mean wedding, no? And of course, the 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 joke <laughs> for non berliners is kind of lost. Uh, uh, did you talk about things like this? Yeah, we do, we do, and I think we talked about this too. Um, it's not only, yeah, I think you got it. It's not only the wedding as as wedding. It's it refers also to this special area where uh, a lot of poor people and migrant people especially from Turkish and other uh, European countries used to live. Um, and the same thing, and this touches, mm -hmm. their situation touches really regional, this this place, Plötzensee, uh, Westhafen. Yes. And yeah, yeah, we discuss it. Um, but I think in this poem, we more discuss the question of, uh, of, um, Sonnenschirme. Yes. <laughs> what is the real good word? Is it umbrella or is it something else? <laughs> or yeah, Pommersche Großmutter, how could you go with that? Yeah. Even Strandkorb doesn't really have a good translation in English. Yeah. The whole I the whole notion of a Strandkorb, these sort of big basket like beach chairs. It almost shelters it doesn't really translate as uh, yeah and, right. and um uh, again wedding uh, for me there is also the, this picture if uh, the, the among the turkish community is happening a wedding then you hear it because yeah. there were a, a course or a rally of uh, cars and and hoopen and something like that yeah so it's and, and there is a huge uh Strada, like like an autobahn, even uh, right beside the Plötzensee, so where where you could you could ride there. <laughs> yeah. The beauty of the book is that it is uh, published bilingually, which is uh, really gorgeous, and it's not happening happening that often. 
uh, nowadays and uh, we kind of like uh, want to hear now a couple of more poems and we're going to start with the lamp in 1866 Gasthaus zum Lamp. Yeah. 1866 Gasthaus zum Lamm. Hinter den Judenhäusern bis 1925 wohl noch. Dann Amerika, ein Stein auf den Gräbern des Judenfriedhofs in deutschen Worten und denen für Adonai, dem Herrn, in dem 60-Leute-Dorf. Zwischen den Äckern und Hügeln, eine Stunde entfernt von der Stadt, leben zwei Sinti-Familien. Ein Paar von der Grenze, die Frau von hier, er von dort und der Diamantenschleifer aus Amsterdam geflohen. Vor Isabella saßen später für den zwölfjährigen Jesus im Tempelmodell oder standen über Auschwitz nach Warmeling, da wo die Straße hinter den Judenhäusern Heißt in Warmeling mit Katze und Hund neben dem grobkörnig verputzten Haus der Nachbarin, bei der die betenden Männer über der Schlafzimmerdecke zu hören sind, mit ihren alten Schuhen. Es knarrt ein bisschen, wenn sie sich neigen. An den Samstagen hört sie nicht, will den Fremden, will den Fremden den Weg ja nicht zeigen. Nie, nicht, kein Betsaal hier gegeben, will nicht nichts finden unter dem Dachboden. Die Lehrer daneben halten die Jalousien geschlossen. Im Dorf nebenan wartet ein alt gewordenes Göppelskind. Rosa vom Haus hinter den Judenhäusern ist die aus Auschwitz, sitzt neben ihm bei der Kirmes und hebt ein schäumiges Bier, die andere auch. Sie schlürfen und wischen die weißen Münder ab. Auf dem Dachboden liegen abgerissene Schulterstücke. The Lamb Inn, 1866. Behind the Jews' houses, probably till around 1925, then America, a single stone on the graves in the Jewish cemetery, with German words and those for Adonai, the Lord in this village of 60 inhabitants. Between hills and fields, an hour from town, live two Sinti families, a couple from the border, the woman from here, he from there, and the diamond cutter from Amsterdam, who took flight from Isabella. They sat later for the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple or stood via Auschwitz to Wameling, just where this, just where the street is called behind the Jews' houses in Wameling, with a cat and dog by the rough cast walls of the neighbor's house, where men may be heard praying above the bedroom ceiling in their old shoes, it creaks a little when they sway. On Saturdays, she does not hear them, does not want to show these strangers the way. No, never, no prayer room here, does not want to find nothing under that attic roof. The teachers next door keep their blinds closed in the neighboring village, waits an aged Goebbels child sitting next to her at the parish fair. Rosa from the house behind the Jews' houses is the one from Auschwitz and raises a foaming glass of beer, as does the other. They slurp and give their white lips a wipe. On the floor of the attic lie torn off epaulets. Über das Fahren im Schnee, wenn die Arme dünn gestreckter Zweige wie vergebliche Fingerzeige in die Atemluft tragen, Vögel in Schwarz aufliegen und sich niedersetzen, Weiße Winde vor Fenstern flirren, ein einzelner Baum auf der Höhe sich widersetzt. Kein Schneeweiß, kein Rosenrot. Steht er da und steht da und immer nur da. Was stehst du, Baum, und siehst in die Felder, die Bäche und Flüsse, Mensch und Tier, die Luft steht steif gefroren über deinen Ästen und weist mir Wege, von welchen die da gewesen waren. On traveling in the snow, when the thin arms of stretching twigs like futile pointing fingers reach into the air we breathe, birds in black take wing and settle again. White winds flutter at the windows, a single tree on the ridge resists. 
no snow white no rose red it stands there and stands there always in the same place why tree do you stand there gazing into the fields at rivers and streams human and beast the air frozen stiff over your branches showing me paths once taken by those who passed um so uh these two poems um i mean the the first one the the lamb in there's a lot going on in this poem and i wasn't able to suss out everything um but i was really interested in this historical layering of jewish life um that that is the sort of kind of all combined here at different different historical temporal moments you know 1866 1925 the idea of Judenhäuser, which um, you know, certainly in the Third Reich, uh, the the place where um, Jews were relocated and relocated and relocated until they were then deported um, to the east, uh, meaning to death, was that the term Judenhäuser. So I, that's there. Um, this um, the the diamond cutter cutter from Amsterdam who took flight from Il Isabella. That's the expulsion of the the Jews from Spain in 1492. So there's so much going on here, um, and and I think about this this idea of this uh, of this small town um, has this Jewish history, and it's a layered Jewish history. It's not a single Jewish history. Um, and then this neighbor, and it took me a while to figure out what this neighbor is is doing. Um, this this double negation that is happening with where the neighbor the the neighbor um, she does not hear them, does not want to show these strangers the way, no, never, no prayer room here, does not want to find nothing under that attic roof. This kind of double negation, it's sort of a, a denial and then a denial of the denial, which is, is kind of the, what is often happening in the traces of Jewish life in Germany, right? Sort of a denial of the long history and then, then the, the, the double denial, which is the erasure of the history. Um, but there's so much going, more going on in this poem. Um, and I wonder if you could give us a sense of some of these historical traces, where, where you're finding them. It was this, you know, and I didn't know where Vameling was, I Googled it, um, but that was something I could, there were a lot of names Vameling, but I couldn't find a place Vameling. So I really want to know uh, what is Vameling and why, uh, Ibra Auschwitz or via Auschwitz to Vameling. So Vameling seemed to be something more than just a place, um, but I wasn't sure what that was. Oh, okay, so Vameling is a, a, um, a, a certain name uh, near a, a very, very little tiny village which really exists. And what also really exists are the uh, Sinti family, uh, the cemetery, the Jewish cemetery, um, and saying, and the Diamantenschleife also. Uh, yeah, so sometimes these places have strange, are crowded by strange people. You have no idea how did they get there. And for sure, the Sinti families got there via Auschwitz which means they also uh, shared the fate of the Jews and uh, made it uh, had not illegally were uh, in the concentration camp and managed to survive and ended up there. And, and what really also is um, reality that in the near there was living this, um, this looks like um, extra marriage child of Mr. Goebbels, um, but this is not the main thing. Is it the child of Goebbels or not? The thing is that the children of the perpetrators and the others uh, will sit on the same table or live in the same village and uh, yeah, um, could, could do nothing about it. Just um, go back home with your own history and the only moment you share is, is the beer. And um, this thing in the neighbor, what the neighbor is doing, this also is something 
real happening. For example, Baden-Württemberg is full of little villages where a huge Jewish countryside population had existed. In some villages, uh, half of the population, even more, were Jewish. And also, um, this had left traces in language, language-wise, that the people don't know it anymore. And if you dig anywhere, if you open any house there today, someone who knows would would be able to say, oh, there is a mikre in this house. And the, the people would say, they live there, they would say, oh, we use it for the pigs as uh, they can, um, they, if they were thirsty. Yeah, for them, it's it's really nothing. They know nothing. They pretend to know nothing. And uh, so these circumstances exist. Um, others went into these spaces, into a former synagogue. Don't don't feel the presence of the the others anymore, and do not want to feel them. Yeah, they do not want to um, that any anyone would come by and say, "Look here, look here." And um, in the near of this area where I was talking here about the, the, the Grenze, the border means between uh, West Germany and East Germany, um, there is another Jewish cemetery. And a couple of years ago, I walked by and yeah, I found uh, the tombstones um, destroyed. And I filed uh, something at the police. And uh, later on, it was, uh, I was told, uh, I'm mistaken. There's just nothing. I'm mistaken. I'm just mistaken. And I went there with a 16 year old girl. She accompanied me and she, she couldn't believe it. She said, Yeah, but, but we saw it. <laughs> What's, yeah, okay, it's, it didn't happen. Yeah, so the same thing, this overlapping, but history here, of course, now goes even more back and back and back, uh, which which is even harder to, to, to realize because all these people who could have told me or you or one another about this are not there. There were only the signs of their former being left. And their, their German being, yeah, it's important. There is that a tombstone on the graves, the cemetery of the Jews in German words. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, nowadays it's nearly unbelievable. What on the tombstone, Jewish tombstone German words? Yeah, yeah, sure, it was not this, they spoke German. <laughs> They were Germans. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, and I mean, this um, epaulets thing, surely clear now after 45. <laughs> you went into your closet and looked <laughs> what should be deleted. Yeah, you kept the, you kept the coat because you needed the coat, but you rip off the epaulets and leave those behind. Them. Yeah, because yeah, it, it, yeah, for a moment, people were poor. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't get another one. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the other the second poem um, on traveling in the snow. I mean, this was uh, when Matthias mentioned that you write quite a bit about objects. And this is one of those that, um, you know, one and the other the poems that you, you still are to read. Um, and immediately I thought of this Rilke poem that I really love called Eingang, which is also about a, a tree. It's about a black tree. Uh, uh, this isn't a black tree, it's a black, birds in black, but yeah. it made me think of, of, of uh, Rilke's um, Dinggedichte, thing poems, um, and the ways in which, you know, that these the, 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 the objects themselves are such carriers of meaning um, far beyond their objectness. Uh, and and this poem, I mean, this idea of uh, the first when I the first um, two lines when the thin arms 
of stretching twigs like futile pointing fingers. And for me, the pointing fingers were about accusation. You, you know, you point to some, but it's futile. There's no either, there's no one to point to or your accusation doesn't come through. Whereas in the second stanza, it's really about the the, the showing uh, and, and the Weisen, which in German is much more of a pointing gesture than just showing, showing me paths once taken by those who passed. So, I mean, I don't know if, if this poem is about, I feel like all, all of these poems are about those who passed um, in some way, and, and the, they could be about those who, who passed because of historical violence, because of the Nazi period. But if that's true, that's, it's, you know, that, that switch in the finger from accusation to sort of pointing to the traces is an interesting uh, move here. And I don't know if you meant it to be that way or if you see that, um, but uh, uh, I'm curious about that. So you expect me to to know that? <laughs> no, but I'm not sure what I think myself um, yeah. about it. The question to the tree, I think, is a really interesting rhetorical question. Why tree here? Why tree do you stand there gazing? Um, it really, you know, in a sense, the accusation is is turned back on the tree. Why are you? they're still pointing and, and that and, and not doing anything. Yeah, but this could also be a human being. It's also possible. Yeah, why does a human being exist after all? Yeah, after what happened? And and, and it happens uh, even after the, the the worst of the worst experiences, people are there. Yeah. You, you can't imagine that they were still there. They were there. You know, so one can ask him or herself, why am I there? And there's no answer. The lines I really like in this poem are a single tree on the ridge resists, no snow white, no rose red. Kein Schneeweiß, kein Rosenrot. So the, the, the single tree, as we really read as a symbol of German romanticism, which is really Caspar David Friedrich. Mm -hmm. And then to combine oh. it with uh, this wonderful uh, uh, fairy tale, Schneeweißchen und Rosenrot, yeah. white and rose red. Um, and this kind of like is uh, really resistance against description and uh, resistance against any kind of like romanticism, mm -hmm. which also works with fragments, but you work with splinters and splinters, as you explained, are not forming any kind of hole the fragment still has the hope of whole. And those poems seem to also resist this idea of wholeness. So nature also becomes, you know, the sign, as, as Aaron mentioned, a sign, but it's a sign which is kind of like also, it's not really speaking to us in the sense, yeah, it might weisen mir den Weg, it might show me a way, but the way means also probably, yeah, there's no way to kind of like make history uh, kind of like good or, or, or whole again or something like this. This is not possible. And I really like this poem. And, and there are lots of traces of, of fairy tales and, and moments of, of romanticism, which, which are scattered in this in these poems. And I find this very interesting. It's very intriguing. Also very hard for the translator to kind of like really evoke those images, which uh, in German are very, very powerful and immediately uh, susceptible for all of us. Hmm. Yeah. Well. Should so, I then proceed? Can I ask a very complicated question? I mean, kind of yeah. like since since fairy tales are for many of us the first stories we kind of like encounter when we are kids. Uh, how's your relation to to fairy tales? Or, or were, were there no German fairy tales? But probably there were, right? The Grimm fairy tales were very prominent in your use as well. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I read them all. I mean, I didn't have much access to books, but this was available and I was grateful for everything. <laughs> yeah. It really looks strange to see Snow White and Rose Red, uh, and I like this from the translator's point of view, uh, to kind of like scatter it with this, uh, with a hyphen in between it kind of like- Yeah, yeah, we discussed that. Fantastic, mm. fantastic solution. I think to kind of like point to 
the, the, the uniqueness of this concept of Schneeweiss and Rosenrot and, and fantastic. Mm. Aaron, we have time for one last big question because I'm seeing the time is already kind of like running out, but I don't really want to leave you without having uh, two more poems maybe to conclude our reading. Mm -hmm. um, so I suggest maybe olives and uh, and then the, uh, the ones where... answers. Yeah, we should end with this. Uh, but maybe Aaron, you have one question. And thank you so much for for joining us today, um, Aaron and and Esther. That was really intriguing to kind of like get to know so much about your poetic universe. And I I also love to read in the preface of Agalbrais how important poetry actually was for you to kind of like find your way as a writer, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I actually was surprised uh, when I read that too um, because I you know I read Yoemi's Tish Yoemi's Table I guess it's in, in English uh, quite a while ago and I always it always I always thought you started out as a poet um, if you read that especially that text that that is a novel written in my opinion by a poet um, and so actually to um, to to learn that you drifted toward poetry after that you moved toward poetry after having published uh, that that was a little bit of a surprise for me. Um, had you written poetry or had you just not published it? Um, you know, did how what what constituted your move to poetry? Yeah, it's it's, it's an interesting question. It's 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 the what would you guessed? I haven't just published it. Mm -hmm. uh, also I started to to write Yoemi's table and I had finished maybe 40 pages and I had no idea how to proceed, really no idea. And the publisher said, oh yeah, it's interesting, um, uh, but I will be away for a year. Um, it, it would be fine if you're done when I come back. And I realized I couldn't proceed. I couldn't, I was, I was empty. And then the whole year he was off, I spent in uh, writing poetry. And after that, I sat down and I threw away the 40 pages I had already. And very in a very short time, I wrote Yomi's Table. Mm. So the, the yeah, doing poetry really enabled me to speak. Yeah. So if anyone's interested, Yoemi's Table is published in this uh, book, Contemporary Jewish Writing in Germany. Um, and it's a good translation, I think. Uh, it's been a while since I've read it, but I think it's a quite yeah. a good translation. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So we come oh. to the end, to the last two poems, and I just have a suggestion. So first of all, uh, we continue with uh, the uh, Bodies of the Olives in German and then the English translation. And then maybe we can reverse order uh, for the last poem, Anka and Esther. So maybe Anka is reading the once verse first in the English translation, and then Esther ends with Die Gewesenen. I think this is always nice to hear the author's voice at the end. Thank you, yeah. Okay. So, die Körper der Oliven, die Oliven der Körper, an einem der Fenster fehlt eine Olive. Die Olive kann man nicht kaufen. Sie ist handgemacht und alt. Manchmal stehen Oliven im Krieg. Sie werden dann Gefallene. Ich liebe platzende Oliven, sie schützen meine Ohren vor dem Donner der Gefechte. Es gibt keine weißen oder roten Oliven. Der Olivenfabrik war die Farbe ausgegangen. Dann nahmen sie die kriegsgrüne Farbe, bestrichen die weißen und roten damit. Die wanderten mit den anderen in die Presse. Es war ein Gift, das sich in der Pfanne erhitzte. Viele Menschen starben. Wir pflanzten weiter Plantagen, bestrichen mit kriegsgrüner Farbe. Aus meiner Familie haben die Bäume überlebt. Die Menschen liegen darunter. The bodies of the olives, the olives of the bodies. An olive is missing on one of the windows. You cannot buy the olive. It is handmade and old. Olives are sometimes at war. They are the fallen then. I love bursting olives. They protect my ears against the thunder of battle. There are no white or red olives. The olive factory ran out of paint. So they took war green and painted the red and white olives. These went in the press with the others. It was poison I heated in the pan. Many people died. We continued to plant the orchards using war green paint. 
The trees in my family have survived while my people lie underneath. The once wars. I can't take a step without falling in with the once wars. The women wearing baseball caps and joggers, one in pink, do not know the once wars behind them, in front, walking beside them, up the hill with their kids, pushing the bikes of the ones who are still small. Oh, really, they say, well, I never, and unbelievable, at the foot of the overgrown graveyard, boys opening their beer bottles, smoking, music, camel pants, and close cropped hair, very close. The ones wars walk straight through them. They're not bothered. One burps, they glance at the path as if someone had pa has passed, but it was only me. Die Gewesenen. Nicht einen Schritt kann ich tun, ohne den Gewesenen zu begegnen. Die Frauen, die eine Schirrenmütze tragen und Jogginghose, die eine in pink, die wissen das nicht, die Gewesenen. Hinter und vor ihnen und begleiten sie den Berg hinauf, den sie mit ihren Kindern besteigen, deren Fahrräder schiebend, wenn sie noch klein sind. Ach, wirklich, sagen sie, das ist interessant und kaum zu glauben. Am Fuße des überwucherten Friedhofs entkorten die Jungs ihre Biere, rauchen Musik, Hosen in Tarnfarben und kurz geschnittene Haare, ja sehr kurz. Die Gewesenen gehen mitten durch sie hindurch, es stört sie nicht, einer rülpst, sie sehen dem Wege nach, als sei da einer gegangen, es war aber nur ich, es war aber nur ich. Yeah. Es war aber nur ich. It was only me. Thank you so much, uh, Esther Dischereit, for sharing your poems with us, to talk with us. Thank you, Anka, for reading them so beautifully. And thank you, Aaron, uh, for your wonderful moderation. This was our final event this semester. We have a wonderful summer. Be hopeful. And remember to join us now for the after party. Walter is sending you the link once more right now. You'll find it on your screen in the chat. Please copy and paste. The International Writers Series will return for a third season this coming fall with Mary Jo Banks' presentation of her new translation of Dante's Purgatorio as one of our main many highlights. Please stay tuned for more exciting events and thank you all for joining us.